Uh, that's a major focus of what we talk about in this subject. And I want to give you a bit of a laugh here. Has anybody seen what's this, this called the Hayek Keynes rap? Some, some of you have seen it. Okay, well, let's have a listen. I was hoping the sound covers through it properly. Let's see. Good. Lord Keynes, welcome, sir. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Your agenda. That won't be necessary. I am the agenda. <laughs> tell them I've arrived. And then tell them I've arrived. And your name is? Hi. F.A. Hi. Party at the Fed. All right. 20 minutes. Lobby. John Mayer Keynes. Uh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, we're opposed. We oppose each other philosophically in the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more with us. It's the animal spirit. John Mayer Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's on track. Questions in session. Have a seat and I'll school you in one simple lesson. 1929, the big crash. We did it down to the economies in the trash. Persistent unemployment, the result of sticky wages. Waiting for recovery? That's outrageous. I had a real plan. Any fool can understand. The advice real simple. Who's that to get the man? CID all together gets to why. Keep that total flow and watch the economy fly. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more with us. It's the animal spirit. You see, it's all about spending. Hear the register cha-ching. Circular flow. The dome is everything. So if that flow is getting low, doesn't matter the reason. We need more government spending. Now it's stimulus season. So forget about saving. Get it straight out of your head. Like I said, in the long run, we're all dead. Savings is destruction. That's the paradox of thrift. Don't keep money in your pocket or that growth will never live because business is driven by the animal spirits. The bull and the bear. And there's reasons to fear its effects on capital investment, income, and growth. That's why the state should fill the gap with stimulus. Both the monetary and the fiscal. They're equally correct. Public works, dig and ditches, war has the same effect. Even a broken window has the glass man has some fault. The multiplier try to fire the economy's health. And if the central bank's interest rate policy takes a liquidity trap, that new money suck in the banks. Deficits could be the cure you've been looking for. Let the spending soar now that you know the score. My general theory's made quite an impression. Revolution. I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty. Still, I'm taking the back. So say it loud and say it proud. We're all Keynesians now. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I made my case spread, bitch. Listen up. Can you hear it? I'll be in it in broad strokes, just like my friend Keynes. His theory conceals the mechanics of change. A simple equation, too much aggregation. Ignores human action and motivation. Yeah, as a justification for bailouts, payoffs, by polls with machinations. You provide them with cover to sell us a free lunch. Then all of that we're left with is death and a bunch. If you're living high on that cheap credit hog, don't look for a cure from the hair of the dog. Real savings come first if you want to invest. The market coordinates time with interest. Your focus on spending is pushing on bread. In the long run, my friend, it's your theory. Perspective. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more interest no. rates. It's the animal spirit. The place you should study isn't the bust. It's the boom that should make you feel leery. That's the thrust of my theory. The capital structure is key. Malinvestments wreck the economy. The boom gets started with an expansion of credit. The Fed sets rates low. Are you starting to get it? That new money is That's driving the ones who invest in new projects like housing construction. The food plants the means for its future destruction. The savings aren't real, consumption's up too. And the grasping for resources reveals there's too few. So the boom turns to bust as the interest rates rise. For the cost of production, price signals were lies. The boom was a binge, that's a matter of fact. Now it's devalued capital that makes up the slack. Whether it's the late 20s or 2005, 
ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful and is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by middle ends. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. I'm often a critic of stuff you see on YouTube as a summary, but I think that's extremely good of both parties. Maybe a bit less uh, good to Keynes than Hayek, but both good in both cases, and there's strengths in both those views. So it's a, a, one of my favourite little comedy elements of the battles between economists. But it isn't just in economy. In comedy, these things happen. Let's go on to the next slide. And this is a set of economists from different schools of thought talking about what they do. So let's start with the Austrian. And Austrian doesn't necessarily mean the nationality. It's economists who began in Austria. There were Austrian economists beginning it, but it's a school of thought which is fairly powerful in American conservative circles. And this is one of those uh, extemporaries of it here. First speaker this morning is Dr. Walter Block. Dr. Block is the Harold E. Worth eminent scholar at Loyola University in New Orleans. He's a longtime member of our senior faculty here at the Mises Institute. In 2005, he was awarded the Murray N. Rothbard Medal of Freedom. And in 2011, he was awarded our Gary G. Schlarbaum Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Pursuit of Liberty. I think he's the only person to ever win both. His talk this morning is an Austrian <laughs> critique of mainstream economics. Give it up for Walter Block, please. I'm supposed to be talking about an Austrian critique of um, mainstream economics. Instead, I'm going to be attacking um, um, Tom Woods. <laughs> He cheated, he cheated, he's a cheat. What happened is uh, I told him to look away and I grabbed this rook and he saw that he had no rook and he demanded it back. Now, I call that cheating. And you know, once he exposed me in my cheating, uh, I just sort of lost it, so he won fair and square. Okay, Austrian economics. If I had to pick a synonym for Austrian economics, it would be praxeology. Because I see praxeology as the key element, the key essence of Austrian economics. There are others at other institutions, schools, who will tell you about Austrian economics and they'll mention 15 or 20 different elements, and I'll mention 15 or 20 different elements, but they won't mention praxeology. And to me, praxeology is first and foremost, it's the defining characteristics, it's the essence, it's where we really distinguish ourselves from them guys. And it's the reason that people like Gary Becker, my old dissertation advisor at Columbia, and um, James Buchanan, another Nobel Prize winner, consider Austrian economics a cult or a religion because of praxeology. So what is praxeology? Praxeology is the logic of economics. Let me give you some examples. If I trade you my tie for your pen, it must mean that I value your pen more than the tie, and you value the tie more than the pen. Now, it might not be that you really give a rat's rear end about my tie, but you think I'll give you an A if you make the trade. And we don't know what's on our minds. I'll let you carry on and watch the rest of that. It's an hour long, but that's the sample of an Austrian economist. That's the successor of Hayek. Now, he might not be exactly the same as Hayek, but that's what he sees as his intellectual root. Another uh, extreme is a Marxist, and this is Richard Wolff, and great, oh great, it's been closed. Well, that's, that's YouTube doing a bit of censoring there. I'm not particularly impressed by that. Richard should not be censored. Okay, let's go for another Austrian. This is a market guy. So Austrian economists tend to have a fairly strong hold in stock markets and so on, and this is one, uh, one instance of that. 
Oh, that doesn't Hi. make sense. And welcome to another edition of Strategic Business Insights. Today we're going to talk about Keynesian economics and whether or not it's a good thing or whether it's a bad thing. Uh, and straight up, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not a believer of Keynesian economics. Uh, but we all need to understand basically what it is and what the reality is today. So Keynesian economics basically says when we have a recession, in other words, when people, the psychology of a population thinks, oh my gosh, we're going into rough times, they restrict their spending. And so we actually end up in rough times. People spend less money, so the economy contracts. And when that happens, the government needs to jump in and spend more money to offset that. So the population spends less, the government spends more. Again, I'll let you carry through on the whole thing, but that's a market perspective, and he's going to come out critical of that. This is, um, I hope this one hasn't been censored. Let's see. Good? Okay. Good afternoon, and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for April 4th, 2012. The internet has been a buzz over the blogosphere boxing match between Nobel Laureate and New York Times columnist Paul Krugman and the debunker of conventional wisdom and superhero economist Steve Keen. It went a little like this. That's how we see it, at least. Steve Keen taking on the mainstream machine of economics for people who don't see the world through neoclassical lenses. Because, hey, we sure can. In fact, I can't see much of anything out of these. Now, he makes some headway of... Well, I'll tell you also carrying on with that particular one, so I'm caught up in this debate in a fairly large way as well. Uh, but that's the nature of economics. It is an area of dispute and debate, and you'll get a lot of... If you go, went to Cambridge University, for example, you wouldn't be told that. You say that we, there's the right one and the rest you can ignore. Now we think, in fact, the ones that think they're right are normally awesome. quite wrong. Awesome. Let's just, let's go on further. So that's, economics is about, about disagreement. And can you think why they might disagree? Why do you get such extremes of views about the economy? Any idea? Would it be to do with political views as well? Political views, like you can see the, the people like the guy who has been censored is actually a Marxist pro-social socialism, so socialism versus capitalism, political views, left versus right, sure. Some people different things in the economics. Pardon? Some people want different things in the economics, some people want different things in the economics. They want different objectives. Yeah. Someone wants social justice, others might want uh, you know, extremes of, of wealth and uh, capacity to innovate and so on, yeah. Any others? <coughs> okay, I'll give you a few of mine. It's often just that they... First of all, the, one of the essential things is we can't observe the economy from the outside. We're in it. If you're being a car mechanic, you're not going to have different opinions about a car. You might think which is a better car and a worse car, but you're going to know the engine causes it to go forward, it needs fuel. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to specifically state all the various characteristics quite well. So part of it, we're inside, we're inside what we're trying to observe. So we can't actually observe the economy in the way you can observe something which has been engineered. So what we do is we, in, we invent a framework. And that framework is called, in, in the philosophy of science, it's called a paradigm. It's a way of viewing what you're looking at, a perspective on how things function. And then what you will do is build a model of that within that paradigm that in, lets you explain part of what you can see. And the paradigm itself selects what it thinks is important. So if you think innovation is important, that's what you'll focus upon. You won't necessarily look at inequality. Equally, if you think inequality is important, you won't look at uh, innovation necessarily. So it selects the data that tends to confirm it initially, and people become very passionate about their particular paradigm. And we also try to make predictions about the future. You try to explain the past as well, but a lot of it is saying this is going to happen in the future, and you'll see quite extreme examples of that. Now, once an economist has a paradigm and a model, when you ask them a question about the economy, they will answer a question about their model. Okay? They don't see the economy. They see their model. So the answer that comes back is, you ask what's going to happen with the economy, you say, well, if that happens in my model of the economy, this is what happens. And they can be vehemently opposed to each other because their models start from different paradigms. Now, what happens when the model tells them something that doesn't actually <coughs> happen in the real world? Well, do they chuck the model out and start all over again? That'd be good, wouldn't it? They don't. They tend to double down. 
and they try to modify it so it handles what it didn't handle previously. That's adjusting the paradigm. And how do they invent a model in the first place? Well, I think astronomy is a good guide. So a lot of this lecture is going to be looking at what happened in astronomy about 500 years ago. We went from a view where the Earth was seen as the centre of the universe to where the Sun was seen as the centre of the solar system. That's quite, a, quite intriguing because, again, early astronomers couldn't see the universe the way we can see it now. We have the, the benefit of the Hubble telescope, we've got SpaceX, all these things that others actually perceive the universe. We've got two, two probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which are now outside the solar system, still sending back data. So the, the level of knowledge you have is enormous. The other extreme, who's seen the Milky Way? Has anybody seen the Earth? You've seen, where'd you see it? Northumberland, so fairly low light levels up there. There's so much light pollution, we don't see what our ancestors saw every time they looked up in the sky. And when you first see it, what, did, what was your reaction when you saw it? Stunning, isn't it? My, my first experience, I was uh, 18, end of first year uni, and a bunch of school friends, we were still friends at university, went on a, a road trip, this is in Australia, from Sydney up to a country property my family used to own. And we didn't actually get there. Cyclone stopped us getting there. Uh, on the first night, we camped out. We were playing cards in a big tent. I got bored with the conversation. A bunch of engineers and scientists and myself and a couple of mathematicians. Nerdy conversation. I went outside and I said something rather dramatic. I won't repeat it here because I'd, uh, I'd get attacked for the swearing in class. And they said, what are you looking at? I looking at, oh, my God. It, they call it the Milky Way because it looks like somebody spilt milk over the sky. Okay, it's this patchwork of white just curving over the sky ahead of you. It was so dramatic that I slept out in the open that night. Now, that's dramatic for us because we don't see it because of light pollution, but our ancestors saw it all the time. And the big question they had is, what is it? How does it work? How did they interpret it? Well, when you take a look at what they saw, they saw the sun and the moon rising and falling. They saw the stars rotating, and they saw the planets wandering. The word planet actually means wanderer in ancient Greek, okay? because the stars covered a perfect cycle all the time. The moon and the sun, perfect cycle all the time. But the, star, the planets wobbled around. So here's a little animation. This is a place like Northumberland you're talking about earlier, somewhere in America, I think. Let's see if it'll actually run. That's what they saw. That's the Milky Way in the middle, the absolute core of the galaxy as we now know. That's what they were seeing. So it was a fascinating thing to try to understand and explain. And 2,400 years ago, Aristotle said the Earth was stationary at the centre of the universe, and the universe rotated around us, and that looks like what's happening. Okay. But the trouble was, you hear this vision of spheres, crystalline spheres, and all the stars are on this big orb of spheres and they orbit around us, around the Earth, and then the Sun and the Moon are also on perfect spheres orbiting around the Earth, and the planets are on perfect spheres as well, and an essential part of it, the heavens are perfect. Heaven's a place where nothing ever changes and it's all perfection, whereas Earth is a place where things decay. Earth was imperfect, that's where things live and die, things fall over and so on and so forth, change and decay was the pattern there. So this was the vision that um, Aristotle had. This is not a, from his time, obviously, it's in Latin, um, but um, a similar vision. There you have the Earth at the centre. You can see the, the water, the sky, the, sky, the, light, the, the flames. And you have the moon. Look at the sequence. There's the moon, Mercury, Venus, and then the sun. And then Mars. Jupiter, Saturn, and then all the stars in the hor horoscope, which we still muck around with today. So, quick question. How would you explain comets? What do you think they thought comets were? Could they be heavenly things, comets? <laughs> they can't be because heaven's perfect, isn't it? They thought they were atmospheric phenomena, something happening in the atmosphere. They had no idea how far the atmosphere extended, and they thought the comets were taking place here. So that's why the comet was assigned, the, the, you know, the three wise men, all that stuff for Christian religion and so on. Now, at work for the stars, the sun and the moon, 
but the planets didn't work because they kept on changing direction. And they moved sometimes left and sometimes right in the <coughs> sky. They got brighter and bigger. They got smaller and dimmer. And this was change. Now, that wasn't supposed to happen in the heavens. They sped up and they slowed down. And this is the apparent motion of Mars. If you look at Mars from May to December of 2003, that's what it does. It starts over here. It goes, it turns around, and it comes back again. And understanding those visual patterns was a huge problem for the uh, believers in this model of how the universe operates. So when you look at it against the zodiac, let's see, this is a little movie. Ah, oh, pardon me. I lost that one. Okay. Now, so it, it didn't work for the planets. And about 1900 years ago, a mathematician philosopher called Ptolemy said you can modify the model to make up what planets are doing. So you've got an initial paradigm. The paradigm is the Earth is the center, perfect spheres around it. The modification of the paradigm to make it fit the data is that there are, Earth is not quite at the center of the universe. And that makes sense because if the Earth was the center of the universe, it'd be perfect. Okay, so it's not perfect, so you can put it off center and excuse that still within the paradigm. The heavenly bodies rotate on what they call deference, big circles, but the planets were on other circles they called epicycles. And they, because they were circles on circles, they'd occasionally appear to reverse direction. So this is the overall model. There's the actual centre of the universe. That's where the Earth is. There's an angle between the two. There's one of the big circles on which the, one of the planets rotates. And then on that planet, on that cycle, it rotates itself again. And that's the vision. And once you had that model, you could fit the data. Okay. So you had a model that could actually, given the levels of mathematics, arithmetic that applied at the time, you could pretty much perfectly predict what was going to happen for hundreds of years in advance. Okay. So it was a big achievement to be able to say the planets will be in this location in two or three years' time or 20 or 30 years' time. So it had 70 cycles, roughly 70 circles all up to define it. Now, of course, it was completely wrong. Okay? It fitted the data, and it was completely wrong. Interesting paradox for people who think fitting the data alone is all you need to do. But it did enable accurate prediction. And it was brilliant for its time, but, of course, quite strange when you look back at it. Let's have a look at a bit of a history lesson here. I'm hoping that starts. Let's see. Ah. I'll go this one. This is the motion the planets were supposed to do. And you can see how the circle makes up for the speeding up and speeding down, the, the planet getting closer and moving further away and so on. All that stuff happens with the model. But it's not the real, it's nothing like what the planets actually do. Let's see this one. There you go. That the planets don't really play ball. As they move across the night sky, they change speed, appear to get bigger and smaller, and even go back on themselves. Ptolemy tried to explain this away by arguing that the planets sat on small spheres called epicycles, which rotated around a bigger sphere called a deferent. This explained why they might look as though they were changing size and why they sometimes even change direction. Unfortunately, that still didn't fit all the facts. It didn't easily explain why the planets appear to speed up and slow down. So, rather desperately, Ptolemy fudged his model further by moving the Earth away from the centre of the deferent and having the deferent rotate around an arbitrary point in space, the equant. But now, the works of astronomers like Albert Tony. So on we go. You can follow with those and get more with it. I think it's quite fascinating stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I don't get how this is linked. Excuse me? I don't get how this is linked to It's economically going for a similar process. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And this is a mathematician did this little trick here. He wanted to show that if you had a model of circles on circles on circles on circles on circles, you could draw Homer Simpson. Okay. Lots of circles there, as you can see. And we're following a particular point on one particular circle. And as it spins around, you can't try to see it now because the guy is deliberately hiding the overall pattern. But you'll shortly start letting the dots remain so you see what's actually being drawn. I think it starts now, roughly now. So if there was a planet in the solar system that moved, apparently moved around Earth and draw the shape of Homer Simpson, far more complicated than the shape you see the actual planets draw, you can still model it. Okay, the paradigm fits this particular weird data. There's Homer Simpson turning up. So the idea of circles on circles as a paradigm is quite powerful in fitting the data of astronomy, even though it's completely wrong. So here's Homer. <laughs> so even though it's completely wrong, they hit upon a way of looking at the universe which could accurately describe it. And my point, and there is a good question there, what does it do with economics? The same thing applies with the economy. So modern astronomers will say it works beautifully, but it's just wrong. The idea that you can predict something doesn't mean you understand the fundamental principles behind it. So there's more to think just prediction. You must understand the structure somehow. And I think economists are still at the phase where they're like the battles between Ptolemy and, and Copernicus. The dominant school has something which <coughs> did predict the data except for the 2008 crisis. That's where they fell over. So prediction doesn't mean understanding, but they thought they didn't understand it. You've got to get the structure right as well. And here we go. I was actually about to ask your question for you. Just beat me by about five minutes. So the economy today, I think, is as poorly observed as the universe was back at the time of Ptolemy and Copernicus. The, the, the big thing for Copernicus to make the point that his model was correct was when he showed people craters on the moon, which you could only see with the first telescope, <coughs> and when he showed moon, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. They weren't supposed to have things orbiting them, but they did. And that was the big intellectual flaw. Now, what we've got today is, in economics, one model dominating how people think about the economy, and that's the one you'd be taught at most other universities, and only that one. You wouldn't get exposed to the others. But there are many other schools, and I want to go through them and say how they're looking at exactly the same thing, the economy, through very different eyes and getting very different conclusions about what the economy will do and has done, and its good and its bad sides and so on, and the disputes about the models. Okay? It isn't the economy, they're doing exactly the same thing. What they're disputing is their model of how it behaves. So, this is with astronomy, the question that Ptolemy said for himself is, can I explain the motion I see of the planets using perfectly circular motion and assuming the Earth is the centre of the universe, roughly. I could get away with saying it's not perfectly in the centre because then it would be perfect and the Earth's not perfect. So you could justify that particular imperfection. Uh, and then, bang, you can do it, as I've shown you. Copernicus asked himself the question, can I explain the motion also using perfectly circular motion? Now, that was a mistake because the motions of the planets around the Sun is not perfectly circular. It's elliptical, like a football. I mean, a rugby union style one, not a, not a soccer ball, obviously. Uh, but assuming the sun is the centre. Um, and yes, he could do it fairly well, but it didn't quite fit the data as well as Ptolemy because when you had the sun as the centre and you assume the planets follow circles around the sun, you don't fit the data 
as well as having Ptolemy's system. So Copernicus's system initially was not as accurate as Ptolemy's because the planets move in ellipses, not in circles. And it didn't have the offsetting elements that Ptolemy's theory had to compensate. So a Ptolemy and astronomer faced with a Copernican explanation of the universe would say, your model's not as accurate as mine. Dismiss it. Okay? And in a sense could legitimately do that. Now later on, Kepler came along and explained where the elliptical orbits come from, and Newton explained the actual forces involved by developing the concept of gravity and the inverse square law. So the same thing applies now with economics. You get a whole range of first questions people ask. And once you've asked the first question, that defines your overall paradigm. So the dominant school in economics pretty much asks the question, can the economy, without any external intervention, set demand equal to supply in every market? Okay, is that a bad question? You can't say, can you? It's a legitimate point to start from. Another one, and this is more the, that's the neoclassical, the first one. The second is more Austrian. How does innovation and change occur? Is that a legitimate question? Yeah. That's more Marxist. How did capitalism evolve and will it change into something else? Again, you can't rule out the question to start with. What caused the Great Depression? Can it happen again? Is that a good question? That's the one that I work on. How does the economy produce more outputs and inputs, and what does this do to the environment? Good question. Okay, so these are all valid starting points. How do real people behave in actual economic circumstances? That's called behavioral economics. Again, a legitimate set of questions. How do the relations between the sex affect the economics? Feminist economics. Again, a valid question. Can we understand the economy using what physicists have invented? And a lot of physicists are doing precisely that. So those are all legitimate starting points. You're quite okay to ask any of those questions and proceed from that point. It's the point of how you answer the question and then what do you do when you get results you don't necessarily want. That becomes a defining feature of whether the paradigm is growing and explaining more or shrinking and under attack. And you'll see that varying for all those different paradigms uh, as I go through this lecture course. So you might have things like Copernicus' set of answers that do accurately describe the universe. Okay? You might get Ptolemy's that don't, but fit the data. So it's very, very hard to progress. And it's not a criticism of economists to say that they get wedded to their explanation. Because in every field of endeavor, human endeavor, we end up believing our own explanation. So you get committed to your core question, and what you answer is what your model does about that core question rather than necessarily the economy. And that's just human, that really is human nature. I, I, I see humans as being, we're logical, we, we, we do think, we can reason and so on, but we tend to share beliefs in every field. And scientists are no different. They will believe they're our paradigm and push that forward. Okay? But then this question of with you coming into it, is that a good paradigm to believe is an important question too. And that's what I want to take you through. And you get taken through in Kingston in particular, much more so than other universities. So how do we get to a better model? Well, astronomers went from Ptolemy's model, which was accurate predictively, could match any <coughs> observed motion as you sort of could match Homer, Sons, Homer Simpson, but it was structurally completely wrong. They went to Copernicus's, which was less accurate initially, it couldn't fit the orbits as well as Ptolemy's model could, but it was structurally almost correct. Okay? It wasn't circular motion, it was, it was uh, elliptical, and once you had that, it worked fine. Um, now, what actually happened was the telescopes, a new way of observing the universe, changed the paradigms or challenged Ptolemy's paradigm because according to Ptolemy's paradigm, there could not be satellites orbiting other heavenly bodies, everything orbits the Earth. And suddenly you look up and you see that there are moons orbiting Saturn and Jupiter. Okay? Wow, that's not supposed to happen. And that's, that is a challenge to a core element of the paradigm. You can have peripheral challenges, things that are extensions that if you don't get those right, that's okay, that we, can, we can live with that one. But you suddenly see that there are moons on Ptolemy's on, on the Saturn and Jupiter. Or you see craters on the moon. Now, if there's craters, there must have been collisions. If there have been collisions, the motion in the heavens can't be perfect. That's paradigm threatening. 
Okay? That's so big that you think, oh my God, I, I can't continue using this, this vision. There's something wrong with this vision right at its core. Okay? And then equally, another important thing was Ptolemy stuff was easier. Ptolemy stuff was incredibly complicated to calculate. To get the right size circles for the deference and the right size circle on the epicycle and get them moving at the right speed to match the motion was a huge amount of arithmetic. Predates calculus in many ways, but a huge amount of arithmetic to do that. And Copernicus system was just easier, ultimately easier to calculate. And very importantly, he could work out the distances. You notice that the sequence of planets was wrong. What's closer to us versus what's further away was wrong, as we know it now in Ptolemy's version. Copernicus would say how far they were by using triangulation. And then once you had Kepler's laws about ellipses and the rate at which a, a, planet, a planet carves out an arc in an ellipse, then Copernicus took over and became more accurate than Ptolemy. And that's where we got to the modern world we have where we understand Newtonian gravity and so on and so forth. So getting rid of a bad paradigm was a huge part of progress in humanity. Everything you take for granted today had some of its origins in that battle between Ptolemy's vision of the universe and Copernicus's vision. So it's extremely important. But it took a hell of a long time. So Copernicus published his book as he died. Why do you think he did that? Prefer to die of old age than being tortured to death. Okay? That's the fate he would have had if he'd published this. It was heresy, according to the Catholic religion at the time. Uh, he was only forgiven... I think about less than 100 years ago by the church, freed of the crime of heresy. Uh, Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter in 1610. He was put through the Inquisition and forced to recant and say, well, no, in fact, uh, the Earth doesn't move. But what he did was he wrote a satire <coughs> comparing the two models, had a second Inquisition, and finally, in the late 1600s, the vision that the sun, the Helios, was the centre of the solar system was finally accepted. Then along comes Newton... Uh, you know, one and a half centuries later, and we have a mathematical model to explain the fact that the orbits exist and follow the paths they do, how things move on Earth as well. So what caused motion on Earth was the same as it caused motion in the heavens, gravity. Uh, so we had a wrong but predictively accurate model dominating how we thought about astronomy for 1,400 years. Now, I'd argue, and again, back to your question, I think economics has had a wrong but predictively accurate model, except during crises, dominating it for 150 years, called neoclassical economics. I'm quite happy to say I regard it as a failed, a failed uh, theorem. But it still dominates the profession. It's still what's taught at the majority of universities to the exclusion of the other schools of thought that we'll cover here. So there was no predictive need to change. You needed a crisis, some sort of anomaly, before it could change. And there were, as well as the, the, the biggest anomalies, we're seeing craters on the moon and moons orbiting the other planets. But also, when you look at the, the length of the day, uh, the calendar kept on moving, Easter kept on shifting. Um, and they couldn't even get a one with 365 days plus leap years to work properly. Um, and there were observational problems, that particularly, this, this is the big one, the imperfections in the heavens. And it was complicated, very, very complicated, extremely hard to work it out. Now, when it's hard to work out, but you actually fit the data, that makes you think what you've got is accurate. Okay? You've got to work really hard to work something else. And some smart aleck comes along and says you're doing it all wrong. How are you going to react? Okay? And this is, again, what economists have done as well. Incredibly complicated methods. They have an off-center point of rotation, the rotation of the main deferent, the rotation of the epicycles. So ultimately, that was a reason people defended it initially, but ultimately it got so complicated people thought there's this simpler method that's been developed, let's go across and use that. Now economics itself appeared settled before the crisis in 2008. Most of you were, I don't know, some of you would have had parents who got unemployed at that time, so some of you would have experienced that way. But it's now, it's over, it's a decade ago. And the mainstream said that couldn't happen. This is Robert Lucas, a winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics, when he was president of the American Economic Association in 2003. And he wrote that macroeconomics was born in the 1940s. Now, that itself is strange because Keynes wrote in the 1930s. Okay. Um, and he said, 
the term macroeconomics referred to the knowledge we needed to prevent the recurrence of a Great Depression. And here he is, as president of the United in American Economic Association, saying, we have succeeded. The central problem of preventing depressions has been solved for many decades. There will not be another crisis like the Great Depression, five years before one happened. Okay. Now, Ben Bernanke, who at the time was, he wasn't <coughs> chairman at this stage, he was on the board of the Federal Reserve, but he was talking about a period before the Great Recession, as they end up calling it, where volatility of unemployment and inflation were declining, and he called it the Great Moderation. And they patted themselves on the back for it. They said that the recessions have got less extreme. Uh, volatility in output and employment has declined. Um, there are many disputes about what caused it, but he said there's evidence that improved control of inflation, which is what his School of Economics focused upon, has been an contr important contribution to this welcome change in the economy. So they were very, very um, sure of themselves. You know, you know the whole expression, pride goeth before a fall? classic English saying, this was pride. They were extremely proud of themselves. They thought they'd solved all these big problems. And the official bodies like the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development made statements like this. This is in June of 2007, two months before we now say the crisis began. It began in August of 2007. And he said, recent developments confirm our prognosis. The current economic situation is better than we've experienced in years. Our central forecast is quite benign, so we expect a great 2008. Soft landing in the United States, buoyant recovery in Europe, etc., etc. Sustained growth, strong job creation, and falling unemployment. Now, I spoke at a conference last week at the OECD where the chairman of the OECD quoted that paper back and said how wrong we got it. Okay? So there's some acknowledgement of how bad the mistakes they made were. This is, again, like finding craters on the moon, like finding moons orbiting the other planets. It's a big conflict to the vision that they had of how the world operates. What are that photos taken? Okay. And this is what happened. This is the great moderation. There's, and unemployment's the red line, inflation's the blue line. You can see them trending down. We're going from 1980 forward. Each of the peaks in unemployment is lower. Each of the peaks in inflation is lower. It looks good. Then bang, crisis. Unemployment rises and inflation becomes deflation. And how did they react? Well, let's actually take a bit of a break. That's been pretty heavy for you. So about a five minute break, come back about say, uh, I may say 10 minutes past. We'll keep on going from there. Okay. The paradigm challenging event, the financial crisis was not supposed to happen according to the mainstream. How did they react? They ended up defending the model despite its failure to capture the crisis. Bernanke again on the other side now. Implications of the crisis for economics. And he said standard models, and they call them new Keynesian, but they're not really Keynesian, as I'll argue later. They're neoclassical models. Uh, they didn't predict the crisis, nor did they incorporate the effects of the financial instability we saw at the time. And he said, does that mean the theories are flawed? I think the answer is yes. Okay. He said no, it qualified no. And they said the models are useful, for the context in which they're designed. And his excuse was, and I truly think this is an excuse, most of the time we don't have serious financial instability, which is a bit like saying most of the time roads are straight. The fact that a corner turns up is not our problem. Okay? So the standard models were great for straight roads, it's not our fault the roads curve occasionally. I'm sorry, if you design a car, it should be able to handle the curves as well as the straight lines. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's defending the model even though it failed. And he actually said the model itself helped us get the stable bit. So it was really good when times were great. And therefore, you shouldn't criticize it. And I've got worse examples than this that I could show you later, probably will in later lectures. Uh, but they really did not say our model is wrong. Now, in that sense, they're no different to the Ptolemaic astronomers who took one and a half centuries to accept that the Ptolemaic model was wrong and Copernicus was right. So that's again, it's this common behaviour. Economists, I'll be criticising economists a lot in this class, but what they're doing is what almost every other area of science has done. People become wedded to the way they think about the thing they're looking at, which is what we call a paradigm. 
And when you have things which contradict the paradigm, people hang on to them despite the contradictions. They'll try to modify, modify the paradigm to work. It's very, very rare that somebody says, this doesn't work, I give up, I've got to change. It tends to be young people who come forward and think about it a different way, and the old ones die. And that's quite literally what a physicist said at one stage. So what Bernanke was saying, effectively, was that, you know, we could draw Homer Simpson in the sky, so they must be OK, and it's the kids' fault. Yeah? That's the sort of vision. So a serious anomaly didn't shake the faith that they have in their paradigm. And that's the same way that initially Ptolemaic astronomers responded to Jupiter's moons. They thought that Galileo had, had drawn the moons on the telescope. They refused to, they refused to see what their eyes showed them. Now, what we're seeing is there been some shifts as well, so it's not universal that they completely denied it. This is a once very conservative economist, still fairly conservative in his economics, a president of the Federal Reserve, saying that we do not have a simple, we do not have a successful model of the macroeconomy. Okay? So that's the sort of honesty I want to see. Olivia Blanchard, he and I correspond occasionally, chief economist of the IMF. And what he's talking about, DSGE models, which stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium, they are the dominant mainstream models that said everything was great before 2007. And he said they're based on unappealing assumptions, not merely simplifying assumptions, but assumptions that are profoundly at odds with what we know about elements of the economy. Okay? So there's some awareness there. And Paul Romer, who is no longer World Bank chief economist, he was... Uh, I think he resigned, but he was under pressure. He said, macro has gone backwards for the last three decades. So it's again, that's why I say astronomy is a good example. It's just like astronomy at the time Copernicus came along. There's a dominant paradigm, neoclassical. There's a very elaborate core model with two major variants, and I'll talk about both of those uh, to, to explain them, the different schools of thought. And there have been many, many tweaks in the sub-models to make them fit the data better, except for the 2008 crisis, which they really can't fit. And then, of course, outside that, there are many competing paradigms. There's not just one. They're not as elaborate as the neoclassical model, but they explain a lot of things that can't be explained by the neoclassical model, such as the crisis, for example, and the Great Depression. And that's a school of thought called post-Keynesian economics. I'm generally seen as being a post-Keynesian. Irving Fisher and Hyman Minsky are two major personalities in that school. Innovation and growth are impossible to explain in a neoclassical model. They're assumed to happen. The Austrians, Hayek is one person, another that I have more time for, though I have a lot of time for Hayek as well, is Joseph Schumpeter. They try to explain how does innovation occur. Extremely important question. Pollution and ecological crises. There's what's called ecological economics. Herman Daly. Still alive and kicking, I believe. Uh, Meadows, one of the um, the, 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 uh, the uh, wife of the party has died. Meadows, I think, might still be alive. I'm not sure. But they're ecological economists. There's many successes as well. They're trying to explain how does the economy cause the pollution we see. Gender and ethnic inequality come up as well. Feminist economies. There's two fairly prominent feminist economists. So they've all got. They're now starting from different questions and they can answer different things about the economy that the other ones can't. And to some extent, maybe we need different paradigms all the time, okay? Because the questions this group are answering are different to what they're answering, different to this and different to that, but they're all valid questions, okay? It's willingness to see when you have flaws in your paradigm or say, well, there's things we can't explain, so I need an alternative. That may be necessary for economics for the future. But when they disagree, the way they argue is like two astronomers from competing schools, Ptolemy's Epicycles, Copernicus's uh, uh, Sun-centric and ultimately uh, elliptical motion. They fight over things. So Ptolemaic astron astronomers, when fighting with Copernicans, would say things like this. If the Earth is moving, why don't we fall off it? Okay. Now, in fact, it turns out Ptolemy apparently did consider a model in which the Sun was the center and the Earth moved around in orbits, but he said that couldn't be real because if that was the case, be, the wind would be enormous. So the absence of wind was his reason for not accepting a, a sun-centric vision, and he built the earth-centric one instead. If the earth isn't the centre of the universe, why does something fall down when you throw it in the air? Now, in the Ptolemy vision, it fell down because everything falls towards the centre of the universe. That didn't apply anymore. 
The Copernicus ones would come back the other way. If everything revolves around the Earth, why does Jupiter have moons? Okay. If the heavens are perfect, why are there craters on the moon? So they're throwing questions that undermine core elements of the other paradigm. And what they tend to do is they ignore the other side. So most of the disputes you'll see in economics are people within the mainstream fighting over how to define a mainstream model. It's about 80% of the debate. So they agree on the model, they agree on the paradigm, they're fighting over the details. But you also get clashes between different models. Okay? So an Austrian economist, like that first guy I showed, you'll be criticising neoclassical, or I'll be criticising ne uh, neoclassical as well, uh, Marxian having a go at each other. So they have a clash. They don't understand each other's worldviews. It is literally like two people from opposed, different religions disputing who is God. Are they going to agree? Never. Okay. So there's at least eight different schools to look at. Neoclassical, or mainstream, as it's called, and there are two subgroups to that. Uh, this is a nickname they use for themselves. One is called Freshwater, because they come from the, uh, the inner, city, inner, inner cities of America on the big rivers. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Chicago, etc., etc. They tend to be uh, believing in a very, very free market vision of the economy. Saltwater, mainstream economists, tend to come from coastal places along you know, Los Angeles, Princeton, along New York, and they tend to be more willing to see the economy as having imperfections. Austrian or libertarian, the first two I showed you were Austrian libertarian. Post Keynesian, which is that I'm seen as being part of. Marxian economists, obviously followers of Karl Marx, though the extent to which they understand Marx I think is a very open question. Ecological or evolutionary economics. Behavioural economics, doing experiments about how do different people actually behave in, when they're given economic choices. Feminist economics. And what are called econophysicists. And these are physicists who <coughs> turn their attention using the to economics, using the tools they develop to handle particle physics and nuclear power and so on and so forth. So quite a wide range of different approaches to economics. All are valid in one sense. They all have a valid explanation. They have, they, have a, they have a starting point which you can't inherently reject for looking at the economy. Whether it actually works is another question. But you can't rule out their initial question they ask themselves that defines their paradigm. So those are pretty much the eight dominant schools. And when you're listening to economic debate, it really helps to be able to say, what does that particular person belong to? Which school of thought are they part of? So if you see a debate between economists and you don't know this, you're going to go shaking your head, what's going on here? But if you can listen to one and say, I think he's neoclassical, that guy's an Austrian, and he's a Marxian, you can follow what they're saying much more clearly. And that's what I want you to do when you look at the different issues we look at in economics. What's an Austrian approach to a financial crisis like Hayek, as you saw, let it happen, but he blames the credit before the boom. The Keynesian saying we can boost aggregate demand, etc., etc. So, in terms of the percentage, the majority, I'd say between 70 and 85 percent of academic economists are m mainstream economists, and they dominate the advice that get given to governments. Uh, and their key question is can the economy reach equilibrium with demand equal to supply in every market? That's their starting question. And the first person to ask that was a French economist called Leon Volras. So you'll often see themselves describing themselves as Volrasian economists, something of that nature. They'll self-describe as neoclassical Volrasian economists. And it's a legitimate question to ask. And what Volra was looking at was the way that the Paris stock market, or commodity market, traded. Because in the commodity market, you would have a gold market and a silver market and so on, and what would happen on a daily basis is buyers and sellers of gold would go to the gold table, there'd be a person there called an auctioneer, the auctioneer would suggest the price for gold, and then there'd be, people would say how much they wanted to buy or sell gold at that price, and if there was a difference between demand and supply, the auctioneer would say another price, until such time as the levels being demanded were equal to the levels being supplied, and then he'd say, okay, that's the market price for today. So the auctioneer worked out an equilibrium price for an individual market. And what Volra was saying, could this work for all markets at once? Interesting question. So this is what happened. He called it tetonement because 
um, a, traders would call out a, a price at random. The manager would work out these demand and supply amounts. If they differed, no trade takes place. Keep on going until such time as there's no difference, and then trade takes place. Is that how you shop? No. no. Okay. But he said, can we use this as a stylized model of the entire economy? And he generalised that to being a general equilibrium model. And this is where the idea of general equilibrium comes from. Can we get equilibrium in all markets at once? Is there a process that ensures demand is equal to supply in all markets simultaneously? And that's what he was looking at. He made plenty of simplifying assumptions. And you'll see this being used all the time, simplifying assumptions, leaving out detail that gets in the way to focus upon the essential issue you're looking at. And that led ultimately to what we now call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, DSGE. And they still contain the words general equilibrium as part of their vision. So this is the whole idea. Can all markets at once reach equilibrium? <clears throat> Austrian or libertarian, maybe 5% of economists. It's very popular with some politicians. Maggie Thatcher was a great fan. She used to carry around a book by Hayek in her handbag. And there's lots of ways to describe their key question, but this is the one that I think is most um, flattering to them overall. How does innovation and change occur? That's an extremely important question. And Hayek was the first one to ask it, so that's where the rap comes from. Not the first, but the most prominent. And they share a lot of the common ideas with the neoclassical mainstream. They believe that individuals are motivated by the desire to maximise their subjective utility. They believe that firms are motivated to maximise profits. And they believe the market reaches out an equilibrium between the utility maximising desires of the consumers and the profit maximising desires of the suppliers. But they also say that markets are never actually in equilibrium. There'll be a reason for being divergent from equilibrium. And out of that disequilibrium, what you find is an opportunity for profit. An entrepreneur can see the price being paid in a particular market is higher than the cost of buying the inputs, so that entrepreneur will dive in, or he'll invent a new product, take advantage of a change in technology. So disequilibrium and entrepreneurs seeing opportunities, that's the major focus that the Austrians have. And that, again, is a useful focus. And they then blame the government for causing booms and busts. As you saw Hayek doing that rap, saying interest rates are too low. Interest rate was set too low by the government. That's what caused the boom. So their best policy is actually to get rid of the government. They tend to be very anti-government intervention at all. Again, their starting point is valid. Where they get to might not be. Okay? That's one of the things to look at. And they want the market to work things out. Don't intervene with the, in, the, in the economy in general. And they tend to reject the use of mathematics. They see economists trying to model the economy using mathematics as being like emulating physics when fundamental particles don't have personalities. They have things that are called spin and charm, but they don't have, uh, you know, they don't change their minds. They don't have minds. And they said, therefore, you can't use mathematics to model the economy. And that's what the guy was going on about praxeology. Yeah? Sorry. What does it mean by when you say What does it mean when you say it's that this Equilibrium is the rule. Oh, um, if you if you done the economics at school, yeah. uh, you'd have the idea of the supply and demand curve. Yeah. Uh, the idea is everything happens where the two lines cross. Well, they say the price will be higher than that or lower than that. Okay? Oh. Like if the price is higher, then there's an advantage to make a gain out of that. If it's lower, you want to short that market. So not being at the two point where the two curves cross. Post Keynesian. That's maybe 5 or 10%. It's a larger minority than Austrian, but it's still a minority. Lots of bloggers, but not, nowhere near as much influence on politicians directly as the Austrians or the neoclassicals have. And their key question is, what caused the Great Depression? Now, it's derived from reading Keynes in the original, not from reading the textbooks. The textbooks completely distort what Keynes said. And they also tend to reject the microeconomics, so supply and demand analysis they're critical of. They say it doesn't make sense. So they criticise that as part of the mainstream paradigm. And they say that's not how markets actually operate. And what they say, we're not, we're try not trying to maximise our utility, we're trying to cope with the fundamental uncertainty of the future. Okay? To be able to maximise your utility, you'd need to be confident about the future and correct about it. But because a lot of what you do is affected by what's going to happen in the future, 
then your speculations about the future have an impact on what you do today. And if those speculations are wrong, you won't be maximising your utility at all. Okay? And they see firms not as, in, not as profit maximising, but investing under animal spirits, where at various times the desire to bring out something new or invest will take over and there will be a spontaneous increase in investment. Not just straight profit maximising implies you know the terrain perfectly. And they don't emphasise equilibrium as much. In fact, some of us work in non-equilibrium all the time. So dynamics, change, crises and so on are part of what they'll see. And they focus on macroeconomics rather than micro. And they see money and banking as essential. So if you look at the mainstream models you do in macroeconomics, there's no money and there's no banks in those models. Post-Keynesian models have both money and banks, and I'll show you examples of that later. And they, they use simplifying assumptions as well, but they say they must be realistic. They criticise the so-called simplifying assumptions of the neoclassicals as very unrealistic assumptions. There's a battle over whether you need realistic assumptions or not. And they use mathematical models. They don't always, some of them do, but then it always say we're going to solve the model for equilibrium. Others look at it changing over time. Then there's behavioural, which is maybe 1 or 2%. They're very prominent in the media. A lot of economists you'll see writing columns in The Guardian and stuff like that are behavioural economists. And they're saying, how do real people behave when we give them an economic choice? And it began in rejecting the idea that of what the, the neoclassicals have a simplifying assumption, they say, a rational man, we're all rational calculators. Okay. We work out the best possible outcome for ourselves and that's what we do. And they say, well, that's not how people actually behave in experiments. We do experiments, we give them economic choices and we find they don't maximise utility. <coughs> they often make choices the mainstream will call irrational. Like, for example, loss aversion. You might be given a choice of two outcomes with a gambling odd attached to the two of them. And what they tend to say is, well, people will look at something where they might make a large gain and on probability they should take it, but the chance of a, of a, of a loss means they don't actually take the gamble. It's called loss aversion. They might hold onto shares when shares are falling rather than selling them. And they make a larger loss because they remain devoted to the shares. They look more on micro than macroeconomics. They haven't really worked out a way to macro the model the macroeconomy. It's all how individuals behave in market circumstances. But they're trying to look at actual behaviour, not some hypothetical model of how people behave. So much more involved with the psychology. Marxian economics, maybe 1%, maybe less these days. Tiny minority now. Very popular in left-wing political groups for obvious reasons. And their key question, again, this is being flattering in terms of making it as relevant as possible today, how did capitalism evolve? Will it become something else? And they see capitalism as being based on exploiting labour. And they say that ultimately it will lead to socialism. So you'll see a lot more of that happening today after the financial crisis than you saw beforehand in politics, but not really in academic circles. And they assert that capitalism is prone to crises and stagnation. And they get pretty good marks on that front after the financial crisis. Okay. They can say Marx was right. Based on the works of Karl Marx, they reject the idea about people utility maximising, the sub what they call the subjective theory of value. They say value is not the satisfaction of the consumer, it's the effort of the producer. So they have an objective theory of value. And they focus on social conflict, the conflict between workers, capitalists, bankers, farmers, etc, etc. They see people as being in social groups and they analyse at the level of social groups rather than individuals. Yeah? Uh, so are Marxian economics people who believe in trade unions? Oh, do they believe in trade unions? Yeah, they're most supporters of trade unions. Very much so. In fact, one of the funny things is neoclassicals are now complaining that wages aren't rising enough. Well, the last 40 years have eliminated trade unions. It makes it hard to bargain for wages when you're a sole individual facing a place like Walmart or, or uh, Tesco's and so on. So, hey, big surprise. Um, they sometimes use mathematical models, but they impose a condition on those mathematical models that all profit comes from labour. That's their particular assumption that I'm a critic of. And they expect crises based on what they call the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. So they say there's technological change over time, I mean you're going to use more machinery, less labour, 
There's less labor to exploit, a lower rate of profit. That's their explanation for the crisis in 2008. Ecological, again about maybe 1%, growing, and I think that's a very legitimate thing right now. Again, very prominent progressive circles. Obviously, the Green Party has a lot of people who are ecological economists. And their key question is, how do you produce more outputs and inputs in the first place? How does that happen? And what does this do to the environment? And can we sustain it over time? Again, a crucial question. Did you enjoy summer? Yes. Wasn't it ridiculous? Okay. It was, like it, was, it was almost as good as a spring in Sydney, which for England is pretty crazy. And they reject supply and demand analysis, and they see the economy as an evolving system. So they use concepts from evolution and say the economy, like the ecology, like the environment, evolves over time, changes. And change and adaptation matter far more than equilibrium. And they will focus upon the dynamics and evolution of the economy over time. They're not necessarily mathematical enough about it now, but that's what they do. And they see a link between consumption of energy and generation of waste. Has anybody here call, heard of what's called the laws of thermodynamics? Anybody? One or two nods? Okay. Uh, that starts by saying you can't produce anything without exploiting free energy. Now, by free, I don't mean you don't pay anything for it. I mean it exists regardless of what you do. So the sun, for example, exists regardless of what human, humans do. And the energy coming from the sun is the fundamental reason why we are here. If that energy wasn't here, neither would we be. Okay. Now, of course, in the early days, you didn't, need to, you didn't have to farm the energy. The land absorbed the solar energy. The plants took it in. Photosynthesis gave us plants, which we could eat. Eat the animals as well. Okay, so it's free energy in that sense. The universe provides it. We don't make it ourselves. In fact, we can't make it ourselves. And waste is also absolutely essential because you can't produce anything without producing waste. Now, this is a joke version of the laws of thermodynamics. And the first one is you can't win. Okay, this is a game which you can't win. Well, the, the very first they call the zeroth law. You must play the game. Okay, so you've got no choice, you've got to play this game. First rule of the game is you can't win, which means you cannot make energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. We simply change the form it takes. So the total amount of energy in the universe is a, is a constant. We can convert it from one form to another. If we use that energy to do something, some work, like move something from one point to another deliberately, that necessarily generates waste, which is the next law. And that is that you, to do work, you have to create waste unless there's somewhere you can dump the waste energy that is the temperature at absolute zero. The idea being, if you want to use an engine, for example, your engine, if anybody drive here today, okay, your car probably is operating at about 500, it's somewhere, I don't know the actual technical level, just look up and find out. Probably operating at 500 degrees Celsius, let's say. Well, the temperature outside <coughs> is 20 degrees Celsius. So you can exploit that 480 Celsius degree difference. But in fact, absolute zero is 270 degrees lower again. Okay. So part of that energy you can't exploit. Now, if you were traveling somewhere which is absolute zero outside, all the heat that the, the car generated could be used to push the car forward. So you've got to find somewhere where the temperature is absolute zero to be able to use all the energy your car engine is creating. Third rule, there is no such place. Well, those are the laws of thermodynamics. Now, they're essential, but most of us have never even heard of them before. So ecological economics focuses upon those rules and what it means for production on this biosphere we call the Earth. Feminist. Again, a tiny minority, prominent in social media again. How do relations between the sexes affect economics? And they look at things that are undervalued, so unpaid work, not just by women, but predominantly by women, obviously still in Western society. Um, the glass ceiling that exists in firms, unequal treatment giving gender bias, neglected dimensions of exchange, and they reject the treatment of everything as a commodity. I say some things are not a commodity. Some things you can't buy and sell. You can't buy and sell, in the genuine sense, love. So elements of social bonds exist that economics ignores. And they focus upon the value of non-market activities. Pardon me, it's a bit fast for that one. So that's another perspective. Again, one you can't reject initially. You have to explore it. 
and maybe forever that will be a necessary ancillary paradigm to other paradigms which look at issues of um, large-scale economic coordination and so on. And econophysicists, they're one of the intro, very interesting area. I was actually at the first econophysics conference which took place in Bali in 2002. And one of my colleagues asked one of the physicists, why have physicists become interested in economics? And his answer was quite simple. He said, because we've solved all the big problems in physics. So they're saying, can we use the tools we developed in physics to understand what happens in the economy? And lots of physics departments uh, now have an econophysics person in them. There's actually the world's first professor of econophysics uh, at King's College. And I'm just really trying to remember her, <laughs> Tiziana Di Matteo. So she's the world's first professor of, of, uh, of econophysics. And they've got highly advanced mathematics. A physicist knows far more mathics, mathematics than any economist has ever learned. So they're mathematically far in advance of anything any economist does. Um, and they develop all sorts of tools to handle analysing things like collisions of fundamental particles or things moving close to the speed of light. What we're seeing in astronomy, physicists again have developed those techniques. So incredibly sophisticated techniques for handling large amounts of data when you have unstable systems driven by enormous amounts of energy. And they say, well, that's like the finance markets. Huge amounts of energy coming in in terms of people buying and selling, uh, huge volatility. And they look at the similarities between the collisions they examine in physics and what they see happening in finance markets. And they completely reject the model that economists have of how finance markets operate. You'll be taught this if you do anything in finance called the efficient markets hypothesis. They basically think that's total nonsense and have a completely different set of models about how finance markets actually operate. And they also reject the use of equilibrium. Okay? They have what they call conservation laws but they reject the idea that the system's in equilibrium. For them, the fact that you can imagine the economy being in equilibrium is absurd. Now, you can see various ways in which these schools would overlap with each other. So Austrians, for example, might agree with econophysicists on that particular issue. So it isn't just one group against all the others. They tend to have overlaps and agreements at various places. So that's the overall. I've got through the lecture faster than I thought I would. Typical me. I think too quickly. I'll just give you a bit of details. Uh, the textbook, there is no textbook. This is a recommended book to read, very readable book, a guy called Jim Stanford, called Economics for Everyone. And it's very accessible. Um, this is Jimbo here, he's a good mate of mine, currently living in Australia, uh, Canadian, was a trade union activist, and sees it from the point of view of human rights, environment, ecology as well. So it's not as neoclassical book at all. I think it's a good guide in general to thinking <coughs> about the economy. If you want a heavier one, um, you can get you could get my book as well, which is called Debunking Economics. I don't think I actually listed that. I'll just um, bring it up on a website <coughs> here. The mine's a lot heavier. Uh, let's go. That'll do. So that's the last book I wrote called Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Can we get that for free? Because you're on <laughs> I have a website called Patreon, which is actually, I'm crowdfunded. The, I'm only one quarter time here these days, so I'm now crowdfunded for the work that I'm doing. And if you sign up on, on Patreon, you get a PDF of that. It costs you $1 a month, okay? But you get a PDF of both books. So that's, that's the other one. So you can buy it from Amazon for 21 quid or you could join up on Patreon. I'm not, I'm not pushing, I don't want anybody to do that because I said it, okay? But it's just, it's a possibility if you want a free, a cheaper copy than um, after um, than buying it. So that's the material for there. Um, yeah, sorry. Pardon? Huh? Will we have access to this presentation? Oh yeah, sorry, pardon me. I've got bad, by the way, you might notice I've got hearing aids, I've got hearing aids, so they work well but not like glasses. Yeah, I'll put this up on the website and on my Patreon website, freely available. Just go there and you'll find, I'll link it on the, um, it'll go to YouTube as well, there'll be a YouTube video, so you can see it there. So, um, looks like you guys had enough. Okay, see you next week.
Okay. Has anybody not signed in over here? Make sure you check in. For late arrivals, make sure you think your car over here to check in. Okay.